Oh, hi everybody, apparently we are live. Currently we have no video, but we have been told we are live anyway, as we move into Group A. I assume that I am with Darak right now, as Falcone has gone like a gibbering mess into a corner somewhere to, to cry a little bit to himself. Uh, group A is going to be Philippines, Thailand, Japan and New Zealand. And with me, I believe, is Darak. Or... Apparently I can hear him, but no one else can. So I'm on my own, honor. unlike Jia and Pataya, both of whom have their teammates with them. We're going into Druid versus Paladin. What's this Paladin? It's a new class. Okay, so Philippines taking on Thailand in this first game. So I just scramble around for my notes while staring blankly into the screen for 20 minutes or something without knowing I was live. It was quite entertaining. Right, there we go. We are live. I look like a bit of an idiot, but can you hear me right now? <laughs> I can hear you right now. And you're Brilliant. not just a bouncy Skype image. Yeah, so can, can chat hear me? Uh, give me an IAR in chat if you can hear me all right. And then we'll know <laughs> that we're good to go. <laughs> Thanks. Ava has finally done what no one's ever managed to do before and just destroyed me. You can <laughs> Right, okay, we got the Paladin. This is, uh, I believe, what uh, Patiao and Thailand were bringing last week to some pretty good success. Like you said, it's a bit of a weird one. There we go, there are the IAs. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, they've been playing it very, very well, in my opinion. And up against the Druid from Gia and the Philippines, in my opinion, it's in a pretty great spot. Yes, uh, it's just such a weird change to what we've had the last two days to see paladins and majors and hunters throughout this group but i know that gia has put a lot of time into hearthstone not just for global games but for the sea games as well mm -hmm. so she, her deck choices have been very good through this tournament and obviously with staz as your helper staz one of the biggest oh. money earners of all time pretty terrifying team yeah, he's had a pretty good run through Hearthstone Grandmasters as well, actually. Uh, a bit of an, I think it's fair to say, a slight underdog going into Grandmasters, given that, like you said, he is a very high money earner, a uh, prize money earner overall. But he's had a little bit of a, a dip in terms of performance results before then, but he mm -hmm. absolutely proved his mettle in both Grandmasters and also Masters Tour Soul, where he was the best performing Grandmaster full stop out of any region with his great uh, realization that Rito Highlander Hunter was in fact a very powerful deck and he's kind of been sticking with that as his baby ever since. Excellent choice here whilst we were doing that from Thailand to take the Hunter Hero Power or the expanded Hunter Hero Power for this. The Paladin gets a lot of damage in against Druid. I like the matchup for the Paladin in general uh, but sometimes can't get that last bit of damage done after 6-6 six, six taunts and stuff get in the way and Druid's not very good at coping with the chipping away of that 3 every turn when it's already on a low health total which yeah, happens when you miss out 4 turns the chipping definitely helps. The real, uh, in my opinion, mm. fantastic aspect of this matchup for the Paladin uh, is the chunky minions. It's the beautiful curve that you get at all points along the way. We're looking at, you know, uh, even if you're low on hand size, because of the power of Mysterious Challenger and Bellringer to pull all the secrets out of your deck, you should be able to get a very nice even curve Let most of the miss. time, against which the Druid really struggles. Turns out if you spend your mana, they just can't really fight back against that. Yeah, and it's interesting actually. I would argue that the hunt, the the hunter secret powers don't get the secrets don't give the druid that much trouble, but the paladin ones really do. Noble sacrifice and its friends, those are all basically different forms of noble sacrifice. They all do the same thing. Are actually really irritating for druid to deal with. They really are. Look at this. Never surrender. Perfect. Not only does it keep the uh, secret keeper alive, ready to just be buff, buff, buffed from now f until forever, it also buffs up the rest of these minions. So Starfall isn't doing as good of a job. Once the Annoyer module comes down, even the Oasis Surger is not doing all too good of a job. Patiao, with a grin on his face, is just cold bloodedly cutting down Gia here. While well, smiling happily, that's very scary all at the same time. Um, oh, uh, I, yeah, sorry, I just got corrected by Gallon that 
Felkin, yes, is technically the best performing Grandmaster at Masters Tour, uh, Masters Tour Soul. I'm obviously talking about Grandmasters before the ones that got hmm. relegated through. Obviously, anyone who wins a Masters Tour becomes a GM. That's a, a silly point. Come on, Derek, we have got work to do. Could you stop arguing with your friends and get some work done? Well, actually, I take that back. Some people who get second make GM, even though they don't win tournaments, don't they, Gallon? Even though they lose out on 50k. So, yeah, well, we can all be smug when we're in chat. Or you could carry on. Yeah, or you could carry on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm never smug when I'm in chat. I'm smug all of the time. No, please carry on. I'm enjoying it. Uh, Pateo has been around quite a while, actually. He could have had an even bigger name for himself, having got quite close to playoffs a couple of times, all the way back in 2017, but only really got seen once on the on the big screen, uh, HCT Taipei last year. But him and Dizdai are both kind of not well known, but they're definitely better than people give them credit for, I think. I'll definitely agree with that. I think last week, uh, you know, when they were up against South Korea, despite a couple of misunderstandings, I think specifically around Token Shaman, I thought they were just playing significantly better than South Korea, which is definitely not what mm -hmm. I would expect, to be perfectly honest. South Korea uh, has a lot of pedigree in terms of uh, Hearthstone uh, oh, tournament results. You know, Surrender, obviously, uh, being the real poster child, I think, given his great amount of success over previous years but they've been doing very well outside of that as well in GM move quickly. yes a very going back a long long time it was always vaguely amusing that South Korea weren't particularly good at Hearthstone because sure. they were so good at every other eSport and then Surrender came along along with two or three others and was just like no we're good at this as well I'm lucky so yeah seeing them struggle to Thailand was very interesting because uh, they are a powerhouse now. This is always a scary part for Paladin, and this is where like hero power for the hunter will come in handy. And just starting to run out of curve resources and other things. Still plenty going on next turn. Snip Snap should do some significant damage. Plenty yeah, of things I, for it to latch onto. I really like the way that Patia has been playing this game. Like turn. The way he's kept Snip Snap deliberately until turn six, when it would have been good on turn three, I think was a very, very smart way to play it because he's managed to spend all his mana up until this point anyway, and he's able to get a very, very powerful play on turn six as well. And they only he only needs to fill one turn before he's hitting Ragnaros itself. Yeah, and that's... Not only that, but there are pickups in this deck. It does curve out well. Remarkably, often. I'm very surprised we haven't seen a lot more Highlander Paladin actually in this tournament. I feel that all the fourth decks are kind of meh, and it's certainly no worse than most of the others. I know they have specific jobs to do. We've seen Quern, yeah. Nazoth Rogue to do a job, which is kill warriors, but this deck is just pretty solid. I mean, I do see what you mean for sure, but I don't know. You got to remember that one of the strategies you can go for is target warrior, right? That's what the UK went for. It's yeah. what a couple of the other teams went for. This deck is pretty good against warrior. You know, it's able to curve out and it's able to get a lot of threats down in a fashion which warrior can struggle against. But it's not that good against warrior. Like, if you're going for target warrior, there are better strategies to go yeah. for. But it also struggles quite heavily to the uh, the combo priests and the aggro shamans and if you're already struggling to those matchups you may as well go for a deck that's really good against the warrior or really good against the aggro decks like personally i think it's a little bit of a weak choice at the moment but like you say you have to fill in four decks and maybe as a fourth deck is a little bit underrepresented because i mean if you can hit druids it's amazing yeah, and it's just one of those decks. Like, I, I do agree with your, your point. There's two ways you can play Conquest. You can target a deck, usually the third or fourth strongest, which is where yeah. Warrior lives. Or you can just have good percentages all around. And this has good percentages all around. Again, you are right. The Token Shaman gives it a bit of a beating, although not the biggest beating that Token Shaman gives things. And you are allowed to... I mean, it, it probably gets protected, but... I think it does fine against most decks, but Highlander Hunter is another option. And then, like you say, we've got the, the targeting strategies, Nazoth Rogue, uh, various Druids. I think Druid has been the revelation of the tournament, actually. How can you just talk over this crime that is happening before our eyes? This is 
a federal offense. Drawing the one best seven cost card in the deck in the one turn where they needed to fill the mana before Ragnaros. Insane. That's what the deck does. I mean, I did it every time it when kind I played of this is. deck. Yeah. Oh, that is so. It it bothers me when I because I I didn't play Highlander Paladin. I saw it always curves. I'm like, well, that's just luck. And then I played it a lot. And it just hmm. always curves out. Huh. I guess so I'm gonna have to give it a try. I haven't played all too much this deck. Highlander deck should not just always rip the right card at the right time, but it, it does feel like it does that I mean, so when play, often. When they play Mysterious Challenger, yes, I agree. Your top decks become fantastic, but before that, like almost a, like a third of his deck is one drops. He shouldn't be binding that there. <laughs> Right, I agree. And especially, like you say, if you play Mysterious Challenge, it's a bit different because then your deck isn't one drops anymore. Yeah. But even, oh. I don't know, the Wasp, you just get three minions to stick on the board and you, it costs them five mana to get rid of it and you just do it again. The irritating oh, rubbish cards are just good. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was going to say that Gia was able to rip the uh, Nubisath Defender off the top, which is the one card that keeps her alive. But she's met with Ragnaros as well on curb. And unfortunately, it's losing game one. Definitely what was expected there, I think it's fair to say. And definitely what Patty out was planning for. You're definitely targeting the uh, likes of uh, the Warrior and the Druids more so than the aggressive decks. And I think it worked out very well for him with this strategy. Yeah, and although I was ranting about how good I think this is as a deck, I think it's good as a fourth deck. So they will be delighted to have it out of the way oh. and move on to their real Hearthstone decks. So what have we got now? The Hunter for Philippines. Obviously, if you've got Staz on your team, you have to have Hunter. It's just how things work. Uh, as well as the uh, Druid and the Shaman. And then on the other side, the Shaman for Patia, which is the Quest Shaman. Seeing it a little bit more, mm. I think it makes some amount of sense to go for this given the abundance uh, of warriors, uh, as well as it still yes. has a decent matchup against a lot of the other quicker decks, too. Yeah, I think it's absolutely fine. Week one, we saw a lot of it and it got druided out of existence, I think. Mm -hmm. And then week two, people were like, oh, we just don't want our shaman deck, which is supposed to be our best deck, to get druided. So everybody went for token. And then this week's a bit more balanced. We've got more token than we have quest but it's a lot more balanced than it has been in the other two weeks i think for everyone in chat i just there's there's two lights in this room and there's one directly above me and i forgot to turn it off and it makes me look like uncle fester when i forget to do it so that's why i look like a bit weird <laughs> in that one <laughs> <laughs> well that's down All fixed next now. play stream coming up oh can you imagine I've got the right posture for Uncle Fester. Like, years of playing Hearthstone into the wee hours of the night without ever standing up or doing any exercise has warped my body into a, a good you Uncle Fester. You do realize you can play Hearthstone and exercise at the same time, right? <laughs> good one. <laughs> anyway, uh, back to reality. <laughs> See the mutate there in the hand for Tyler. And I bring that up because mutate has been removed entirely from some bit of this now. Going far more down the value route. Obviously, you still play the evolves and the hairs. But actually, the mutate's kind of a luxury that you don't necessarily need in this deck now. Yeah. The Moga is just a nice thing. A lot of the, the deck concentrates purely on a value. And again, hairs and cheating. That's just yeah. a different sort of value. Interesting choice here between the Ursatron and the Animal Companion. Uh, Ursatron, if it dies, does half the time draw you a good 5-drop for turn 5 in Zilliax, uh, which is a decent way to smooth out your curve, you know, with Hyena Alpha obviously coming down on turn 4. But it's oftentimes a little bit less impressive in terms of stats, of course, um, than the Animal Companion. I don't know where you stand on that one. It's really strange to me. Um, I get it, but the whole deck is full of things like they fetch one other card out of your deck, but one's enough, it turns out, in Highlander. If you can get any sort of advantage at all in Highlander, it turns out that's okay. A little bit concerned how far behind quest completion Thailand have got here. I understand they're holding on to 
their elemental to do more damage with later their mc tech because hunter can go wide and their wasp because it's just an all-around good card but not completing your quest can just result in a disaster in a in a tempo matchup here that's true that is true because you haven't got the best tempo cards outside of the one they just picked up weird old position now for patty out to be and he's ruled out at this point pressure plate snipe i think as the only two secrets because he's only played a spell and a minion and then it mm -hmm. died straight away uh so he's definitely still afraid of rat trap which is why he will be cautious to go in too quickly on this mogu he'll also be afraid of freezing trap so attacking with it at all is something he has to be very cautious of this is this is not an easy turn that he has to make here it's not i think i'd have liked to see them throw the wasp away last turn just to play around with some of these issues it tests for things it gives you a freezing trap tester and then well, they, it makes they, this turn a lot more easy they played coin uh into Piper, right? So it's still t it tests for more stuff that way. Sure. Yes, yeah, fair. Downside here, obviously, because it does activate the Rat Trap, but they do get to see. Oh. oh! What even happened there? I was gonna say they get to see that it doesn't get back to Freezing Trap, thankfully at least, but I wonder if they should have played a Evolve there. They could have got a bunch of two drops and a nine drop out of that three eight, which is a pretty big upgrade. No, I like this. I think okay. they've gone with the... Uh, we can we can take care of this, we think, I next turn. Because the, they've got to trade into us. And then proceed with the Evolve for some more value. Maybe it'd be worth gambling on a 9-drop. But I think the Rat just kills a decent number of them. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't kill a 3-8, which is important as well. Does not. Ziliax does, however, along with the Rat... They're not killing your... You're lucky, that's a good deal though. Very true. That's the yeah, word I was looking point. for. And now Wasp and Zap, and cool. Off you go. So there's, there's two choices I see. There's, what well, three choices I suppose. There's Wasp Trade, Wasp Zap, and... Uh, Sandstorm Elemental plus Evil Totem, and then you can double trade both your minions and get okay. an Evil Totem on board, which is, you know, pretty nice. It might be difficult for the hunter to deal with that, and you can start generating some value. So Wasp Trade is the best, because that allows you the best chance, I think, to complete quest next turn. Okay, fair enough. Can, can they do anything where they just play the Totem? This Overload is really irritating them. I think the wasp has to be used here. Okay, fair enough. Uh, I'm not necessarily convinced. Uh, I, I feel like getting an evil totem down and starting to generate some black while your opponent doesn't have anything on board. Mm -hmm. At the very least, it forces them to make a reactive play when they might not want to. Yeah, it's definitely a tough hand. Because you also want those lackeys to finish this quest off. Because if you don't finish the quest off, the reason I'm prattling yeah. on about it quite so much is you will lose. If you don't finish that quest off, maybe even next turn. The hunter's getting to the path of the curve now where it just starts playing big stuff. And you will lose to the tempo, despite the fact you'll be on the edge of getting a huge amount of value. Yeah. And you, you really don't want to play your Darudi Elemental and your MC Tech next turn for no reason other than completing the quest. Well, that gives a sandstorm elemental a real job. That can smoke trap. That's true. They can use the zap. Um, I mean, I guess they'll probably want to not activate the snake trap if they possibly can. Ooh. Maybe they try to on purpose now with Mogu to see if they can reduce the cost down with three one ones and then uh, obviously zap them all away with the sandstorm. Well, I shouldn't say zap them all the way when zap is actually a card in hand. <laughs> yeah, like, that's awesome. All well away. done, Derek. <laughs> Steal some with your, your tech and then blow them up. Oh, yeah, that's and, true. Um... It could be that, yeah. Because that can be quite handy. Yeah. 
Like, obviously, trading in 1 1 if it's not Snake Trap first, you feel very, very stupid. So I can totally see why they wouldn't do it, and it's probably just Cast Division getting to me there. Okay, I wonder how well this plays around Explosive Trap, to be fair, because if he's not trading in, you probably want to go face as the first thing there. Uh, whereas now, you're obviously too embarrassed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hunter makes you embarrassed a lot when you're trying to play on a normal yeah. secret. And if you're not oh. careful, sometimes you fluster yourself into bigger accidents. This definitely didn't feel like the correct play. It, this felt like quite a, a poor play on this turn. Like, playing Totem and then evolving it in Quest Shaman? I, I'd rather have an Evil Totem than the average 3-drop. I'd also rather not attack yeah. with the Mogu first, because that's weaker against Freezing. Probably would have like gone face first. Like, I think that was a bit yeah, of a I'd, disaster I'd gone... that turn. I think you're okay to attack into the secret keeper with the one one because if it's snakes, you don't care. You just want to know what it is. These snakes yeah. aren't harming anyone. They're not on a plane. They're fine. Uh, but I do agree with you on the totem play. Uh, you definitely want to evolve and then play the totem afterwards. Right. Because you're like, like a random I... lackey is so well... much better than. And this is an okay role. Yeah. The, the problem is, of course, that you're um, you're worried about board size, but you can just hero power instead of going for the uh, the evil totem. Sure. Meanwhile, they're getting hit by Mr. Crush. They are indeed. That was a nice I easy play for stats. The quest. I know. Well, that's what I mean. Like they could have got the Imagine evil the totem down. Two turns yeah. ago at this point, they could have gone Sandstorm Elemental uh, Totem, which gets a lackey, uh, starts generating those lackeys, and it doesn't develop a 3-3, three, three, but you don't need that. You need to start generating value and lackeys here uh, for Patiel. Yeah, I'd have had it a turn later than you, but I'd still have had one now. Um, so that would be worth looking at from both sides. But either way, they need to have a lackey in their hand now, and they haven't got one. Exactly. Yeah, that was so For weird. so many reasons. That was very, very weird. Either way, though... Uh... I wonder how much time they put into this deck, because they have been good, but if you pick up this deck thinking it's just a value form of Token Shaman, you're going to have a massive accident. Yep. Okay, the the crush is out of the way, but honestly, for Staz, this really doesn't slow down now, especially with Zephyrus the Great off the top. What do you even get off of this? Uh, I guess I guess you're probably not playing it now anyway. Like it, it, it's probably not worth it um, to come get down. Get to turn ten, see how close you are to lethal, and pick Tyrion if it helps. Yeah, like if you were to play it now, you could get like a uh, Gavul Shadow Priest. Isn't that good? MCT, air, eh, fine, I guess. Yeah, it's all just a little bit underwhelming. I agree. So now the weird thing about this is that it switches over to the Hunter, who now has to get this done in about... Well, they have to get it done before Shudder Watt comes off the top of the deck, which is obviously sure, like, an unknown amount of time. Yeah, eventually it's going to be uh, Novice Engineer or Cable Route or Shudder Watt, like you said. Like Something's going to come down that's good enough to pull things back. hasn't helped, Tyler. I don't think they've played anywhere near optimally this game, but they also have drawn their cards in just the wrong order. Hasn't made things that easy for them. <laughs> Desert Hair is just completely and utterly useless. I mean, it's a 3 mana 5-5. Five, five. It's a very, very bad King Muckler. It's like King Muckler as cosplayed by five hairs in a trench coat. <laughs> Unfortunately, it means that Unleash the Hound just kills you almost... Yes, sure. But I like the methods anyway. It's been a while. Uh, I, I don't know, even there, like, attacking face with the 1-1, one, one, you know, yes, congratulations, you test for explosive trap. Uh, like, I don't even know if that's worth it. Like, obviously with hairs, you 
don't want to have an explosive trap up. But when are you going to be going face anytime soon? Like, you're clearly playing defensive from here It's lethal! In. It's actually lethal, right? Can I add? I can't add. It's not quite Five. lethal. They're one mana short. No, no, no. They can I'll go, go Savage Raw, right? They can only get Savage Raw. What about Savage Raw? That's still lethal, right? Is that 15? On, uh, yeah, no, it's 17, because there's five, six, it gets a buff of six. Yeah, it's lethal. Cool. Right? Five and 12. Yeah, it's lethal. Yeah, I was thinking it's five and 10 for some reason, but I forgot you get two for your face. So I looked yep. good, then I made myself look bad, and then you saved oh me. That's a pretty cool way to close things out. The Desert Hair looking significantly less powerful than it usually is here. Finally, some justice for the hunters of this world. Staz, unsurprisingly there, getting the win with his uh, Highlander Hunter, as he has been doing. It feels like he's been an absolute on an absolute tear with his Hunter decks and does bring us to one game of peace now between Philippines and Thailand. And there is a Druid and there is a Shaman on both sides. Yep, and I did have notes, but they all vanished in the excitement that was the beginning of this stream. But I believe that the Philippines Druid is slightly different built. I'll look that up for you. Join the break, which I think we'd better take now while I sort everything out. See you in three minutes. I'm so sorry, Derek. One all between the Philippines and Thailand. And just druids and shamans left for either side. Quest shaman for Thailand and a token druid for the Philippines is the major difference. Token and I, we haven't actually seen the shamans. Did I say token druid? You did. I'm losing it. <laughs> we haven't seen the opposite shamans play each other very much preserved. at all in this tournament yet. For some reason, they can either get banned or they dodge each other. 
and we might not see it again because first of all we're going to go with the druid mirror this could yep. go to turn limit this one could be an interesting one for sure given that uh, most of the time when we've had druid mirrors it's been pretty lopsided one way or the other because one player has had nomi and the other player has had banker one player has had malagos whereas the other player has had regular quest there's been a lot of different factors going in this list, however, is 29 cards the same for both players. The only difference being, so far as I can tell, that there is one copy of Swipe for Thailand and King Feoris, whereas the Philippines have cut King Feoris for two copies of Swipe. So it is very, very similar list indeed, both with the Baleful Banker and the Kun the Forgotten King infinite million armor late game anti-fatigue nonsense that can occur. But until we get there, they've got to draw a whole bunch of cards first. So, race to the end, get your Feoris down because that's actually going to be a chance of winning the game. But if they get to the end, there is a chance this just goes to turn limit and both teams get a win. So, how often does that actually happen? How possible is it that that happens? It is certainly a thing that happens. I, don't, I can't give you a number because I'm not that experienced in Druid end games, but I've seen enough tweets that it has happened many times. Sure. Uh, because you get to the Kun versus Kun, everyone's getting 30 health, blah, 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 and you just can't kill them. It's just a stalemate, sure. But, but both sides just gain health quicker than they're losing it. Uh, that being said, though, you've got to get to that spot first with both sides level on board, level on tempo. They mm -hmm. can also end up with different builds at the end, if you like, to use the Battlegrounds sort of terminology, where... You both got the same card at the start of the game, but which five do you actually want to use at the end of the game to kill your opponent with? That can make a yeah. difference. So I think we should take the, the view of excited and interested spectators in this one and see what end game they both play towards. Well, for the start at least, it looks like Gia's got a very, very nice start. We're seeing Crystal Merchant in the starting hand. We're seeing Nourish, two of them in fact, one from the deck and one from a Worthy Expedition. It's a little bit of a double-edged sword, to be fair, picking Nourish off of Worthy Expedition because you can get into the problem later on in the game where you have a Nourish stuck in your hand that you don't have the time to cast lest you kill yourself with a burst a uh, few cards from Fatigue. Uh, and so you end up copying it over and over again with the effect from Elise. Uh, but if you can find them all towards the start of the game, usually that won't happen. And here we see Gia, three nourishes in her starting hand. I'm liking her chances here. The only thing holding them back here will be card uh, hand size. That's really the only thing they have to be afraid of. Yeah, and after seeing the, the messy game from Thailand, the game before, I would be backing the Philippines to be much more tidy when it comes to that final game because you can just end up like you've just explained very eloquently with a bit of a mess not the perfect five or four cards at the end yeah and you want to be planning about now which ones you're going to dump obviously it depends a bit on the game this King Feoris is going to come down on on 10 and stir the pot a little bit the Philippines are going to have to mess around dealing with it yeah I guess that's and, actually and that a pretty lead good... to accidents yeah, pretty good point you make that I said the only thing they have to be afraid of is hand size. That's not quite true. These druid mirrors are not the same as warrior mirrors where early tempo equals zero. You know, it doesn't make a difference because you can't kill your opponent 99 times out of 100. In these, you can. You absolutely can just tempo down your opponent. And here for Patiao, with a double scenarius King Feyoris mm. opening hand with a nourish to boot to ramp up there a little bit quicker, Maybe we're just looking at a turn six, turn seven lethal here for Patiao in the next few turns. Yeah, and even if that doesn't actually get there, which to me it looks like it could well do, it's going to distract what the Philippines are doing. They're going to have to mess around with their star falls and, and not have any fun. And like I say, King Fiori's can just... It's the same as the Evolve, right? Sometimes it just wins the game. Mm -hmm. Even... Yeah, it's going to have a... It's going to be massive as well. It's just going to be the world's biggest Fiori's. If like Patio... Two fives, a six, a four, and two twos. Yeah. This is a tough spot because potentially here, Patio could go Wrath Banker on this turn in order to discard his late game and go all in on the early game advantage. 
Uh, that has a couple of upsides if he goes for that. Number one, he gets a 2-2. It's small but relevant. Number two, he gets uh, another spell in hand for King Feoris. So that's a little bit more impactful on the following turn with a swipe instead of a wrath. Um, and he gets another Oasis Surger in his deck, which is not bad, you know, if you're going for an aggressive game plan. In the end, though, given that he has uh, Swipe as a pretty decent alternative to clear the board and have a similar effect anyway, I can respect keeping the uh, late game potential still open, even though he's probably focusing more on uh, mid game pressure for the moment. Yeah, he has the opportunity to trade in. He won four, but Swipe emptied the 10th card out of his hand, so. Well, I was a little bit rude and said oh, I'd expect they're more likely to mess up than Philippines in this situation. Actually, just doing the good thing, getting rid of the the useless cards, even in a situation where the game's going a slightly different way. And hold on to your hats, because this is going to be a bit nuts. Right now. Oh, yes. Well, no one as nutty as I was expecting. Yeah, I mean, it's not bad, right? Dolmaster Dorian can be okay. Um, even if it's just a couple of 1-1s one is mainly what you're getting in Druid. All that Patia really needed here is a board that sticks against one Starfall and maybe two Starfalls, as we can see, is actually going to be the case. Um, he does technically have the ability to stick something versus two Starfalls as it currently stands. I think one minion can be left alive. But that's not really much of a triumph when you're setting up for scenarios. Oh no, wait, does he not have the ability for even that? No, I think he does. I think he's able to stick one thing on the board. Yeah, and the other thing it does is also pass about the film. He might just not, they don't have to have two Starfalls. They don't have to be sure. able to deal with this. They, they can, as we can see, but right, it's that's forcing the them to have the, the answers at the right time. Exactly. And, and given they... snow, Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing for Patio is this this early push that he's got maybe wins the game. Probably doesn't, but it has a chance to, which always boosts your win rate. But also, it has the potential. Uh, he still has the potential for late game. He kept the banker, which I was, you know, toying with the idea of throwing away, but liked in the end, uh, <laughs> holding on to. They seem to work out pretty nice for scenarios. Obviously, there's always the Loti experiment that buffs everything so much. Pretty crazy decision there by Gia to go for two health on an Oasis Surger as opposed to the full 12 uh, mm -hmm. on her own hero. Uh, do we, do we agree with I that? Think... Like... There's definitely a low breaking point where you want to do that. Maybe two isn't much, but if you lose this board, you're going to be taking so much damage, you have as much health as you like in your deck. Yeah, sure, I suppose. But it's such it's a low a number hit. that, it's yes, it's probably tempting to heal your own face, but in general, I think you don't bother healing your face there. Yeah. I tend to think that when it's Jir and Staz, if they made a conscious decision, not a rote panic, which they did, it's going yeah. to be right. I agree. I mean, I, I definitely trust their decision more than I do my, than I do my own judgment. Like, you know, they've been practicing these decks extensively. Yeah. There's two of them. Uh, I mean, there are technically two of us, but we're idiots, so it doesn't count. I mean, it does seem like a lot of damage to pass up on, but I don't think 12 matters. If you lose this game like it looks like they will, it's going to be a lot more than 12 they would have needed. That's kind of the reiteration of the point. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> Obviously, four mana being spent effectively on Nourish here is a bit of a big investment on a turn when you're facing down this much pressure. They can clear off everything other than the Loti, of course, very easily on this turn. But it's still scary. Scenarius into Scenarius is a lot right. of damage. You may just be able to get Patty out over the hump. And from where they're sat, this is the downside of the play they made last turn because mm. you'd like to have extra health around about now to be able to take a bit of a risk in doing something else, maybe nourish, try and set up your Zephyrus. But instead, right. you are just facing down loads of different lethals from what your opponents might have. I 
again going for the the most tempo orientated play they had the double ferocious howl and all that but no just just keep the board as good as you can as these two guys are just gonna square off against each other in stealthy form yeah what are we looking at here in terms of damahe um six to face obviously on this turn is the most we're looking at but uh i imagine it's definitely going to lead up to being a scenarius turn whether or not you attack i guess is up for debate but i think when you have a six eight on board and your opponent's at 16 you want to start smacking him it's super tempted tempting I just don't really see what else the they're doing. If you go to Snowy Snow, you don't need to smack anybody. Yeah. And again, they do have Starfall, they do have Wrath. Like, the spell power is good, but it's it's six damage. Like, I, I just think you've got to start cashing it in here. Oh, they're still holding back, though. <laughs> this game's getting silly. I know, I mean... Uh, That's one thing I'm I, willing I, to say about it. I am just a small gamer at heart. I, I can't resist that. It's, it's a 6-8 and they just didn't attack. <laughs> How did you play Evolve Shaman for so long when you want to just go, turn one, Sludge Slurper, turn two, oh no, I can't do anything, turn three, hair, turn four, no, they're all dead, I can't evolve them. That's like different because... you have to have that element you're... of patience. That's like investing into later turns where you get to go face for so much more. Whereas here it's like, you know, 6-8, it's just deleted damage that just doesn't exist now. But it's an 8-10 next turn. Yeah, that's true. It's a big clear up of the board here for Patiel. No, for Gia, sorry, on Patiel's board. Obviously still no taunts in the way though, so Patiel <laughs> could push 8 damage face on this turn if he wants to. Or he could leave it stealthed yet again to buff it up to... 10 damage with the 4 mana scenarios on the following turn if he so chose. Oh, <laughs> uh, this is so close. Like, I thought I'd regained composure after that last segment, but I'm so close to just completely losing again here with all these stupid minions that aren't attacking each other by hiding in the shadows. <laughs> just, just don't. A lot of removal has been used here by Philippines, and they're still facing down a terrifying board. Mm -hmm. But the the double loaded is just so insanely good. Still haven't activated their Zephyrus, down to eight cards, I believe. Seven the difference months. here yeah. is if. If Philippines have an accident, they lose the game in one turn. Yeah. If Thailand have an accident, they have one turn to rectify it because of the health differences. And it's not like that just happened. Like, it was again a direct result of Gia choosing to not target her face with the 12 health, which I, I still just really question. Like, again, you know, if it was two health, then that dies to Starfall. It was at three health, though. She only gained two health off of the. the uh... Yeah. Uh, the Hidden Oasis, which, again, I don't know. I, I'm still just kind of perplexed by that one. Oh, not perplexed. I got the reasoning, but uh, doubtful. Yeah. It's a toughie. It's a very tough one. Oh, it's a tough one. Oh, it's a tough one. Well, Patiao's been waiting just to find a good start. Getting... With... Yeah. And whether or not he actually Here needed the Loti, it doesn't matter. It's going to be clearing off everything other than the stealth loti kill surprise on the other side of the board <laughs> could, could become a 10-8 unattacking loti now if it wants <laughs> <laughs> humble beginnings as a 1-2 i've already mentioned the card once to it's just like shade of nakramas nakramas for the modern generation just sits there gets bigger and bigger and bigger and never attacks and then you die But obviously now, serious dangers of just getting a lethal at any point. Digging there for the swipe, I think, first, before deciding to use this star fort they really don't want to use now. Mm -hmm. Play the Worthy Expedition and try and find something, because you don't want to use star fort on this board. And now it's too late. 
they want two sides of oak land to make that play. Oh and this snow is, does not look right at all to me. Really? Why not? <coughs> what do you think was, should have happened on this? Oh, well, okay, I'm changing my mind, I guess. I, I think that it gets cleared up too often by Zephyrus. I know that their Zephyrus isn't active. Maybe Thailand have factored that in. Yeah. Like, this is just another board that's really difficult to deal with. Gia has had yeah. answer after answer after answer, but eventually they run out of Starfalls or Swipes or whatever else, and Patiao is able to go for the lethal. And even if that doesn't happen, we got to remember, Patiao can still go for the infinite late-game super fatigue. They both use their um, Kun the Forgotten Kings, so the super armor gain potential is deleted from the decks. Oh, something that's relevant here, actually. Uh, Philippines are playing two hidden oasis. So, uh, Thailand, right? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, they both are. They uh, both yes, because you know it's one card. Uh, double hidden oasis is quite unusual at the moment, at least in HGG. And sure, makes a big yeah. difference to why you'd make that decision earlier on. You think you're going to get your other one at some point. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. That definitely factors into it, I agree. Especially as there was, uh, I believe at the time, two uh, ferocious owls in hand, um, mm -hmm. which uh, incentivizes you to play a little bit fast and loose with your health. Coming with the flame strike, which of course does five damage. Now they're having to activate to just get a taunt on the board. Yeah. <clears throat> For any Daraks who may be watching, remember that uh, Shadow Flame does not get the poisonous effect from the minion you target with it, because that would be a stupid thing to think. Hmm. Rip me. Right, now we've got down to the end game, and it looks like it might matter. As in, we thought all the way that it looked like Thailand were going to get this done with damage, and they still might. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're, but... they're going to now. They're, well, they're going to have to at this point, because they've played their Elise. That is able to die at this point, and both their bankers in hand. That could shuffle two extra cards in deck, but that's as good as it gets at that point. They're not going to get any more than that. They've given up their infinite fatigue capabilities. So if Gia can stabilize here and clear off everything from the board, they're just going to win. Yep, she still has scenarios available. I say that because Zephyrus is gone, which makes things a lot more messy. Mm -hmm. But she should still have some sort of... I think Kun's gone as well, actually. It has on both sides. So these infinite combo for Philippines, yeah, they just can't get it done. Face it was close as anything. And to what it really was really close all the way through that to those decisions are so tough you've got to have played the matchup a lot to know whether to go for tempo or not because you saw the resistance they put up i mean was that four scenarios uh I think six, three, eight, three but scenarios yeah yeah because yeah, it was a 10 10 attack low t three scenarios and it only just fell over the finishing line yeah flat on it its it was a very weird game. Uh, again, you know, I don't want to say... It's being too results-oriented to say that if they targeted their face with a hidden oasis, they would have been able to survive because maybe their minion would have died easier, you know, maybe they would have died anyway on a couple of turns' time. But they did just need something a little bit more to get over the last um, the last hurdle to be able to survive. But I do want to say that for uh, Thailand there, I think they did a really good job of realizing what their <laughs> role was in the game at all points. Like, earlier on, Yes. They held on to the banker because they thought, okay, there's still a possibility for us to go for the infinite fatigue. We may as well hold on to that for a while. But at a certain point, they realized, okay, we got to go all in on the damage here. They threw away the Elise infinite fatigue, combo, I which I think one. was a very clever way to approach it. Yeah, it got them there and it worked out well. And I want to coin out this totem right now. Agreed. Lovely. Uh, this works nothing like normal Totem Shaman versus Druid, uh, but you can really abuse the fact that your minions just can't be hurt for a long time. Mm -hmm. Pointing out this totem means you complete the quest so quickly, and with a completed quest, you're a happy little shaman. Uh, it's a very close matchup, so you do have to make the most of, of the things you can abuse. Was the um, was the innovate and in hand on turn one? I didn't actually see that. Or... Yes. 
Gia, because if so, a, a lot of time players consider going for Innovate Crystal Merchant just to be able to fight back against exactly this um, from Dizdai's side in the evil totem. Yeah, it was in hand. So it's a little interesting to not see that, I think. But, uh, you know, it's only good against specific hands like you saw here from Dizdai. Yeah, just giving the Shaman that one extra turn, because this really is a race to complete the quest with the proviso that the Shaman has to have done some damage when it completes it. Yeah. Because it can just win by going wide, but nowhere near like the token deck. But you will see weird plays like Wasp just being thrown out here, for instance. Yeah, this is just going to get stopped. Kill the board. something, but yeah. Well, I mean, it obviously does do that, but the point is just to start getting damage on the board as quick yes. as possible. Because until an evolve can be found for Dizdai to really start getting pressure, he has to get as ragtag of a group as possible of minions onto the board. Uh, because, I mean, I would put the Druid at quite a big favorite in this matchup, to be honest. Uh, outside Ooh. of a very explosive start for the Shaman, uh, the Druid eventually just always gets over the finish line. Do you think it's the other way around? I think it's 50-50. I think it's a, just a flip of a matchup. Really? Uh, like, yeah. the, the thing is that the, the value that Shaman gets from its quest is too slow. Like, it's just a bunch of 1-1s. One like, they spend so much mana generating stuff that against Warrior, yes, it's fantastic because they don't threaten you. But against Druid, eventually they just have a board that's too big for you to do anything. Maybe with the, the double hidden oasis, I'm willing to say that maybe the Druid's fractionally favoured. But my experience has been that you tend to just finish them off to the face with life drinkers and wasps, and the Druid is too low. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Let's see how it goes. It's nice to have the casters disagreeing. We've, we've seen so many of the matchups so many times, we've sort of all fallen into agreement. So I'm happy to have a good old argument anyway. As am I. Um, Final obviously, one. a lot of the wind condition is stored in the hair evolved, even now, though. Let's, let's not mess around with that. Uh, sorry, I just started hearing you twice. <laughs> um, uh, once. Mm. Is that better? Uh, no, it's not. I think I might have. You might have been unmuted. Can we, uh, one second, sorry. You take over. I'll sort this out. Okay, yeah, you have a look. See if I need to do anything. It's not been my fault many times, but sometimes it is. Okay, so one more turn left for Gia and Staz to complete their quest. No dangers of bloodlust or horrible things like that to worry about like they normally have to against Token Shaman. So this board can be largely ignored. Just pick off the relevant minions that are scary. Interestingly going for not a lackey there. It is a 2-1, not a 1-1, one, one, but personally I'd have picked off the lackey there. There is a second wasp available, so. Uh, I yeah, think playing around wasp, wasp number two, I'd probably rather just take out the two one there, uh, especially given that bouncing back a two one is probably better than bouncing back a, a lackey in that instance. Fair. But I can see a point. It's definitely something to consider. But this is kind of the spot that I feel like Shaman always gets into against Druid. Well, you know, this is this is not a bad Shaman hand at all. They've got both copies of Evil Totem. They're generating a lot of lackeys. The quest is going to be done nice and quick. But what have they achieved? What has actually happened as a result of all of that? They're just going to lose board control to Oasis Surges and Starfalls and then die. Yeah, I mean, they haven't done enough damage uh, through no fault of their own, I hasten to add. They have been tempoing as best they can. Uh, but they are setting up a ginormous Shudderwalk for one instance. Having a load of lackeys, it feels is stronger than you might be giving it credit for, although I know you know what you're talking about, so maybe not. And just not so easy for the Druid to just set up a board and kill you when you do have the quest completed, which is the current situation. Yeah. That being said, Starfall is going to make me look a little bit silly if I'm not careful here. A swipe might actually be the play. Probably looking at second nourish here. Um, I think like their tempo options are so powerful already with all these board clears that I'd rather just guarantee I don't run out of cards here. Like it's in, in all likelihood, nourish is probably massive overkill here. 
Um, but I think I just like the safety of a uh, state of mind. Yeah, getting very difficult now for Thailand to do it the board control way already. Although they've got a lot of cards to come, and there is a shadow walk. The, one of the things as well that I like here as the shaman is when you get spells, you get double spells from Ethereal Lackey. That can be huge because then you can find yourself something useful. Yeah. A lot of Hearthstone cards interact quite well with a wide board of garbage. I wonder. What my quite thing. sure what the cause is here. Okay, fair enough. But it's more frustrating than playing the Token Shaman for sure, because you're used as a Token Shaman. This is a good board as Token Shaman, as Evolved Shaman. Ooh. Okay, because... double ethereal. Yeah. Now we're talking. That is... Now we've got something rolling. Plague of Murlocs? Plague of Murlocs, yes. Uh, probably yes, the best one here. Yeah. Uh, you know, you can upgrade your own board of 1-1s. You can downgrade a uh, big King Feoris or Kun the Forgotten King board, something like that. Uh... Lava burst. Probably Lava Burst, yeah. Even though Lightning Bolt's like a better yeah. card, you just want as much oh, overkill as possible to try and get the job done. Yeah, maybe they've, they've tested it enough to know that um, Lightning Bolt actually works out better. I'd have taken Lava Burst, just get as much damage as possible. I mean, it's fair but... to say they won't have much mana spare over the next few turns, right? With another Ethereal yeah. and a Shuttle Walk in hand, so I can understand this. And on the final turn, where they, they double Life Drinker, etc., maybe squeezing a Lightning Bolt's all you've got space to fit in. Yeah. But this is just the problem I have with the matchup. It's such like a, it's such classic tempo. It's the fact that Shaman spends its whole turn developing stuff, Gia clears it and plays something. Like it's Starfall plus mm -hmm. Defender, Swipe plus Loti, uh, Nourish plus something else on the same turn next turn. Like it all just stacks up so gorgeously to the point where uh, Shaman has a whole hand full of stuff, but nothing actually comes from it. Yeah, and you're not supposed to have the Druid on 24 at this point, to be fair. Yeah, fair. fair. Uh, I want Haunting Visions here. I want to find Bloodlust or something now. Me too. Lightning yeah. Storm's kind Storm of the bringer. stay alive, but yeah. I, I want one of those cards you're talking about. Like Lightning Storm isn't shaped very well against Druid minions, but to be fair, you do have the Kobold Lackey and the Lightning Bolt which helped make it a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And there is the Stormbringer that we were talking about. Now we're looking at some kind of a play with Hair plus Stormbringer on turn nine, or if they can stick a board, maybe something a little bit quicker. Maybe it's Hair on this turn, just to try and stick something on board <laughs> for Stormbringer. I think I like that. Yeah, that's hard to hard to do from cast division point of view. We've seen- It's just overdraws. Two removal spells, so. I think that was, I actually think that was quite a you lot of play. You don't mind overdrawing here. Uh, I, I mean, guess you like, could overdraw Evolve. But... You don't mind overdrawing that much, but it's just fun that you don't... If, if you're overdrawing anyway, then why is this playback the good? Uh... Yeah, yeah. There, there've definitely been some... some wobbly play on this deck, both last game and this. Game. I, I could definitely just be letting Class Division get to me here. Like, Hair with Evolve is pretty good, but given that this is starting to quite clearly slip away from you, maybe it was best to just take the chance on it there you get five one ones and you can then play a couple of one ones one with that... the stormbringer next turn My hand is too full. Oof, one thing that is surprisingly hard here and something that took me a long time to stop doing when i started playing this deck is you sometimes when you're roping and you've taken too long deciding on your turn you yeah. can't empty your hand you look at all your cards and they all draw you more cards and you start panicking and i think that may have been a thing there Maybe. Don't want to insult them too much because maybe they just chose to overdraw. But the other thing is, on the flip side of that, you soon fill your hand back up again. So overdrawing is not quite the disaster it would be in other decks. Unless you overdraw the gold, in which case it's an absolute disaster. So your argument for putting the hair down last turn was basically, well, if the hair doesn't get it done, the lackeys will. Because you draw loads of lackeys and they just try to make them. Um, your, your argument for making the hair last turn, I'm starting to come around to, actually. 
yeah. which is if the hair gets wiped out, then you just go lucky, 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 rat, lucky, lucky, and you do it again. I mean, you just yeah, make your own hair. My my point more than that was just that this game's slipping away anyway, so I want to start taking some risks. Like, th this could very much just be a case of my very pessimistic view of the matchup. Um, like maybe. Dizdai correctly sees that his position isn't as bad as I think it is, which, you know, fair enough. He's probably played the matchup more than I have. Um, I, I just, I don't know. I, I feel like I wanted to do something that has a very high potential upside, given that on average, Druid just draws a whole bunch of minions, locks you out the board, blah, blah, blah. You know, we know what Druid does. It's the same every game. There's not that much variance. Build on that some degree, people sort of say, why Why does it matter what percentage the matchup is in terms of your plays? Well, we have slightly different views on this matchup, and we're making different plays because of it, so it doesn't matter who's right or wrong in this instance, but when those people ask, what matters, why does it matter? This is why it matters. How you perceive your position changes how much risk you need to take one way or the Big other. Big time. Big time. But now they are definitely struggling to stay in this. And that's despite 4,000 wow. ethereal lackeys. Oh my god, they're getting so many chances to dig themselves out of this game. The, the difficulty is dumping the hand. Where are you going yep. to put the cards? <laughs> I mean like, on this turn... just like... playing one potato, two potato, he's so bored. <laughs> he knows he's on this game. Yeah, I think so. Evolve, brilliant. Evolve. Yep, you take that. Haggis' scheme. Soul? Maybe soul, you've got a lot less to work with than you normally uh, have. Uh, so. scheme, scheme can work out. Yeah, again, my thinking was just again, you know, with a hand with hair and a bunch of 1 1s and Evolve and Stormbringer, that gives you the highest possible mm -hmm. chance of sticking something. Um, but at the same time, you know, if you your opponent is able to get ahead on board, Hag of the Scheme can pull it back for you. Yeah, I think Scheme's usually better a little bit earlier, but I do like Scheme in general in this. It's surprisingly useful. You think, well, you're the aggro deck, why are you playing Scheme? But you become this weird non-aggro defending with a bunch of rubbish deck. You basically become Nazoth Rogue. Yep. <laughs> at this point... Uh, with a shudder walk out. Hmm. I hmm. Yeah, I think I think the the key demonstration of how to play this deck was Mexico in week one in both their matches. They always seem to have nine cards in hand. They always seem to have a big board. This was against Warrior in particular, not so much Druid, where you're under more pressure. But they always seem to have just the right stuff going on. And watching Thailand play, you know, they're burning cards, they're, they're panicking a bit. It doesn't feels seem a little... to be working out quite as well for them. Yeah, it feels like it's a little bit uh, of ad lib here. You know, it's not a well oiled machine for them. They're having to figure it out on mm. the fly somewhat. Which, again, it's Quest Shaman, you know, that no two games are the same. It's very different from Druid, which has very, very few discovered cards. The deck basically functions the same every time in every matchup. Whereas Quest Shaman, you know, look at this hand. I don't think any player will have seen this exact hand before, ever. Yeah, good luck if you have. <laughs> <clears throat> I think I have reached the point now, though, where I'm agreeing with you on this particular game, not necessarily the matchup in general, yep. where you've just got to evolve some stuff and hope you get away with it. That's right. Or more likely, you are done. Bringer. Yeah. Sure, yeah. We need to see Shivalas, Zilliaxes, basically not this. This is the average board, I think. Maybe a little bit of a low roll, but a bunch of 5 fives is pretty easy to see, and it's not good enough. That does mean that the Philippines are able to equalize it. Two games apiece. Shaman on Shaman action. A matchup we haven't seen all too much of, to be perfectly fair, recently with Quest versus Token Shaman. But a, uh, a pretty seminal matchup in Hearthstone, uh, the metagame at the moment. Yeah, I've played it once or twice. <laughs> I'm sure you played it once or twice as well. A and yeah, times. it's something that for whatever reason... I'm not even sure if we've seen it once in HCG. I don't think I have. Which so, is insane to me. 
it is insane, but tell me, where does Lorinda stand on this matchup? I think Token Shaman is a decent favourite. Okay. And I think that the trap for the Quest Shaman is to try and keep pace early on. I think what the Quest deck needs to do is finish the Quest. If it doesn't do that, the Token Shaman will do you with something stupid on about turn 5 or 6. Yeah, I think uh, in, in my experience, I agree. I definitely like my position as the uh, Token Shaman a little bit. It undeniably plays as the aggro deck. Um, because it has to win early on, I find, lest the uh, Evolve Shaman, sorry, lest the Quest Shaman eventually develop enough value and lock down the board and blah, 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 and whatever else. But thankfully for the Token Shaman, it functions better as an early game deck than the Quest Shaman does most of the time. Yeah, and we've seen in recent times, there's one mutate in this deck, we've seen mutates coming out of this deck. Because when you try and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with your... You, you say you've got the same sort of great cards. You've got Mogus, you've got Desert Hares, if you're the Quest Shaman. But when you go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, what happens is you cancel each other out. And suddenly the Quest Shaman has a bunch of rubbish and hasn't finished their quest. And the Token Shaman just chugs along doing what it's done, does it again and kills you. So... You really have to complete the quest. And with that in mind, people are taking out Mutates because... Forcing mm. down a fast Mogu isn't completing the quest. Using your hero power to make a totem to make your Mogu cheaper isn't completing the quest. And I think yep. it's making a big difference. I agree with that. I think you just got to be uh, turboing through as quick as possible. Because the real difference between these decks is the fact that... Uh... Wow, okay. Uh, I was going to say, in my opinion... I didn't like this play. That's why I was <laughs> erring. Okay. Uh, well, I was going to say the quest charm and top decks very well, whereas the Token Shaman top decks very poorly, which is why something like this needs to happen oh! with Mogu plus Mutate into Akali that is going to draw a 7-8 Mogu Flesh Shaper off the top of Gia's deck now. Filthy. Absolutely filthy. Yeah, and it, honestly, I think that was just a bad play last turn from Thailand. I know why? I'm on about completing the quest quickly. But you've got to not just give your opponent a turn three Mogu opportunity. It doesn't matter that it came sure. off the top. I actually said, er, uh, before they drew it. Yeah. They just gave them it. Next turn, you can give them it because it's too late. And But they just gave them that. Something of interest here, I'm interested in your thoughts on it. What do you do about mind control tech if you're the token shaman? Do you play around it a bit, a lot, or not at all? Uh, it depends on the situation, obviously. Um, I think generally the token shaman. Joke, token Shaman, you tend to ignore it, but it's really just about how far ahead you are. You know, if Gia thinks she can't possibly lose the game unless it's an MCT, obviously you play, play around it. But I think a lot of the time you're not actually that far ahead, so you have to play with uh, a little bit less caution. Interestingly, I, I agree, but for maybe different reasons. I actually actively try and make them play it before they finish their quest. Oh, really? Because they have one minion now, or you can have two later. So, okay. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong, if I've got three eight eights and a 1-1, one, one, I won't play the 1-1. One, one. I'm not insane. But if I have a chance between giving them a minion and playing around it, I just want it out of their way. Yeah. Um, because it, it takes them a whole turn to play a 3-3, three, three, steal your guy. It's not a good turn for you. But the longer it goes, the more you're looking to go wide as the token shaman. Right. And the more chance they've got of completing their quest and stealing two of your much bigger things rather than one of your early game rubbishy things. So I want them to play it early on. Fair I don't enough. want them, yeah, I want yeah. them not to have it at all. But I try and force them to use it early on. So now we're obviously looking right, at... Right, wrong, me. Probably... Uh, I don't even know here. Like, You know that Akali the Rhino has drawn all the rush minions is going to because there's only two in the deck. So it's really just the 5-4 body that mm -hmm. you're afraid of right now. But the problem is, you don't want to play an MCT because it just dies to the Lickham as soon as they overload. Yeah. So it's probably Novice Engineer plus Cable Rat to start completing the quest as quick as possible. I agree. Yeah, that puts you onto five. Then next turn, you'll have six mana available with the coin. You can use one of that mana to complete the quest, one of that mana to use your hero power, and one of them to play your MCT onto potential five minion board. Mm -hmm. And all combinations of other good things that can happen around having completed your quest. It's horrible, of course, Token Shaman can just bash you about this turn. But yep. I think you've got to do it. Everything else is just a play to hang on for no reason. 
All right, they're just hoping there's no overload card at all. And at the moment, rewarded. Uh, <laughs> weirdly enough here for Gia, she needs to wonder if it's actually worth evolving the Mogu. Although actually having said that, you definitely just evolved the uh, Akali into a nine drop. That sounds much better. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Do you, I'm do you to not disagree. want to like you go Cobalt Lackey and then the Hero Power and then Moku as well, probably. <laughs> yeah. This works. Yep. Oh, this is an eight nine, of course, of course, of course. Yeah, of course you want a nine drop. Yep, yes. not going Agreed for the hero time. power as well to play around uh, the MCT, which we were talking about. I think, again, pretty yep. smart just to make sure that they're not vulnerable to anything at all. Yeah, to make it clear, the situation I was talking about is early on when you've got a bunch of 1-1s one and 3-4s and 0-2s. Right. If you've got an 8-9 and a 4-12, you don't take the chance. There's no point. It's a totally different situation. <laughs> They're in so much trouble here. And this is, it's been a slightly extreme version of it, and some of it was self inflicted, but this is roughly how this game goes. Mm -hmm. A lot for me, and I do think you can definitely play it better as a quest shaman, but it's still not easy. You need to take Frost Shock here, right? Just to survive? Just don't take eight, yeah. Yeah, sure. And you need to play Novice Engineer because you need cards next turn. For me, at least. Yeah, I think they probably want to save it to go with the Hero Power, but honestly, that seems pretty wishful that they'll even Just get to that slow. point at all. Yeah. Giant trade away the 1-1, one, one. MCT still not a possibility. Look at how gorgeously this all works out for the Philippines. I'm not really seeing any way out of this for Dizdai at this point. Just look at how big these minions are. Nothing can be done. Yeah, and you can see this coming last. I know we can see the Sea Giant, but something's going to be played. That's what they do. Yeah. The Token Shaman's got cards in hand. They, they could play an annoying Thunderhead or something, but the Novice Engineer was never going to be useful this turn. And I Fair. feel genuinely like Thailand didn't really play this deck very well in any of the three games. Yeah, I think compared to what we saw last weekend, this definitely felt like a much weaker performance from Thailand. But they will have, assuming they lose this, which looks very, very, very likely, but it's not over, I guess. The world's yeah, most it's ridiculous over. evolve. It is over. <laughs> Maybe there's a bug and they get new dragon cards. I mean, there is a bug. It's called uh, Skitterer, but it's not even going to be enough here <laughs> to close things out. <laughs> but yeah, they, they've got time to get themselves together. They will have another chance in the lower bracket, of course. But Philippines yeah. looking incredibly strong there. Really, really tidy. We concentrated on the, the bottom half of the screen a lot for that one. Yeah. Because we're used to Gia and Staz playing well, and it just looked, with the one discussion about the Hidden Oasis, which was probably right anyway, we didn't really pick them up on anything, I don't think, in the whole match. That high five at the end there from the Philippines looked fun. Can we try? Are you ready? Sure. Hang on, which way am I going? I'm going this way. Yeah. We're going to high five. No, oh, wrong way. Every time. <laughs> it's ruined. <laughs> no, it doesn't work. Now, <laughs> hey, we got there. There we go. Yeah, brilliant. Just imagine oh, the, the best of friends. Flag somebody has to have for that to work. <laughs> anyway, that is going to be the Philippines advancing through over Thailand. A very, very close series. Yeah, it's been a long weekend here for some of us as well, one might argue. But I think a very, very strong performance from the Philippines overall. Like you were saying, when it's Staz and Gia putting their heads together, I feel like the majority of choices they're making are just correct even if i disagree with them i can always see the reasoning behind their choices which is the mark of good considered hearthstone play so overall i'm thinking they're still just a very very strong contender for the title yeah very much so and they the philippines players have played with and against each other for many years so communication just not an issue they're in the same room makes things so much easier as well
and looking good. But first, they will have to win their winners match later today. And secondly, I'm going to go for a break and leave you and Falcone to sort out the other game whilst I get my grip back on reality. So right. see you soon.